All right, we're going to begin tonight. My name is David Papo. I'm a lecturer at the Sprott School of Business, and I'm teaching a course, an IB course, which is entitled Foreign Market Selection Assessment and Entry Strategies. I started this uh, to develop this course approximately three years ago, and I was looking at different uh, markets which are of importance for business, Canadian business students as well as Canadian businesses. And naturally, the BRIC countries were the ones that came to my attention first. But they had been well, let's say, researched and, and uh, flogged to death by countless professors and, and business people. So I was looking for something different, something that would be engaging for the next generation of business leaders. And it so happened in 2014, the same person who coined the, the term BRIC, Jim O'Neill, came out with his next generation of BRICs, the Mint countries, Mexico, Indonesia, Nigeria, and Turkey. And so tonight we're going to be talking about one of the four countries, the one which probably Canadians know the least about, uh, about and that's Nigeria. And Nigeria is an exciting market because it's an emerging economy which is going to become the economic power of Africa. And tonight we have a diverse group of subject experts that are going to enlighten us on the challenges and opportunities of doing business in Nigeria. Our first speaker tonight, who is in Lagos and is joining us via Skype, is Roleda uh, Akihbe, and she's Vice President, Divisional Head, Transaction Banking at FCM Bank in Lagos. She has a career in finance sector, which spans more than 15 years. She's worked in, in both global and local financial institutions across Africa and Europe. She has an MBA from the UK, Okay, um, I'm going to start with um, my first slide, which is basically talking about three things, the Nigerian landscape, because I heard you mention that it's an area perhaps what many uh, people in Canada know much about. Then I'll go into the opportunities and the challenge that we see. All right, so the Nigerian landscape is this. Most people know Nigeria as being one of the most populous nations in Africa. Right now, we have over 170 million people, and it's still growing. The country as a whole is rather enterprising. So 90% of our businesses, the business entities, are largely micro, small, and medium enterprises. So you have a lot of small businesses, one-man businesses, you know, uh, family businesses going on here. And then the environment is also quite youthful. So about 20%, that's about 30 million people, are between the 18 to 35 age bracket. So it's a young nation. So there's a lot of people, there's a lot of us, and the majority of us are quite quite young. So the working sector is, is quite, um, uh, quite vivid. So I'm going to jump right into the opportunities, and I'm looking at the next slide, which is talking about the population size. So clearly, just by virtue of the number of people in the country, um, the population is a great opportunity, especially for retail-oriented businesses. If I look at Nigeria over the last five, seven to five years, five to seven years, we've had so many international franchises coming in to take advantage of that opportunity. And the slide that I'm showing also shows a different graphics okay so we see that it's up fairly even in terms of male and female so we have a lot of things coming in particularly in the food industry um, in jewelry in fashion um, a lot of international brands have come in so that's a major opportunity because people realize that if I can just get one thing to about 10% of the population then they're going to have a, a fairly decent market so that's quite exciting for a number of people. Then if I jump to, to the next slide, looking at the youth demographics, as I said earlier, the population is also quite young. And what that means is that in terms of getting labor, it's a relatively cheap labor. And then it's also an interesting thing about, about Nigeria and uh, Lagos, which is the commercial capital, is the fact that the, our rate of adoption of technology is really quite quite fast, okay? And there's a part, uh, there's a section in Lagos called Yaba, which is fast becoming, you know, Africa's Silicon Valley. Uh, there was a survey that was run and found that the highest number of technology developers outside of uh, the U.S. are actually situated in Lagos. So the young demographic is, is actually, they're young, they're vibrant, and they're very tech savvy. So if you look at things like uh, mobile phones, for example, you find very few Nigerian 
homes that actually still have a landline, but most homes have at least, each individual has at least one or two mobile phones. So you have an 80 million people, about 80 million people using mobile phones in the country. And then obviously the technology that goes with that, the apps that need to be developed for that, you know, so there's a lot of opportunity in that space. And um, people are fast taking advantage of that. I'm going to jump into the next slide, which is looking at the natural resources. Now, as far as nature goes, I think this country has actually been quite blessed. We have a very, very good weather. So obviously we're in the tropics, so it's um, it's either rainy season or dry season. We don't have monsoons, we don't have typhoons, we don't have snow, and the land is actually quite fertile. So the graph, um, there's a graphic that was on my slide, I'm not sure if you can see it clearly, but it just gives a snapshot of a few things that, that grow here. So we have um, agricultural resources, so whether it's cocoa, cotton, the peanuts, the rubber, oil, palm, all the natural resources. Everybody knows that Nigeria is an oil exporting country, so and uh, that's been a major opportunity for us, at least up until the time when you know oil prices started to go south. But outside of oil, we also have other resources: uh, coal, limestone, bauxite. You know, there, there's so many things that that we have. Um, but it, it just so happens that because we have focused largely on oil in terms of the exploration and production of oil, a lot of other natural resources have sort of been left uh, fallow and hasn't actually been been marketed and developed as well as it could and should be. And so I'm going to jump right into the challenges now. One of the major challenges is, I would say, is around infrastructure, infrastructural issues, especially around electricity, energy, and transportation. So if we're looking at energy now, with a nation as populous as ours, we are the optimal um, power we should be generating based on some, some task force I was set up a couple of years ago was in the region of 12,800 megawatts. But power generation right now is at just over 4,000. So clearly that's about, we're well, putting about 30% of demand. So that's the challenge, particularly for enterprises. You find a lot of manufacturers, a lot of companies are running on alternate power. Their um, diesel generated engines are used for to ensure that we have constant power, that's electricity. Um, yes, a lot of companies also so going into gas, liquefied gas, as a means of powering, uh, but the average home, you know, is running on electricity. So they, it, pretty much each home here has you know, on your natural on the natural grid, and then you also have a, a standby generator. Then another challenge is in the area of transportation. So because the transportation isn't very effective in terms of public transport, whether it's interstate or interstate, this poses some challenges, particularly for companies that are involved in logistics and distribution. Uh, because we have had, other than road, air travel obviously is a bit expensive, and then we have a rail system which pretty much um, was left fallow but is now being revived. So those are the major challenges that exist around infrastructure. And obviously telecommunications, it, it was a bit of a challenge before, but I think we're surmounting that with um, cables being laid, and obviously we can have discussions like this. I mean, for instance, I'm in Lagos, you're in Canada, and we're Skyping. So a lot of things have improved over the last five to 10 years. I'm going to jump into the next slide, which is talking about policies and regulations. And I would say this would probably be the bane of, um, for, for businesses doing business in Nigeria would be policies, because there seem to be frequent changes in policies and regulations, particularly in recent times. I mentioned earlier that we're a major exporter of oil. So since the oil prices uh, went south, the, the central bank in particular has been taking a lot of um, initiatives and putting in place a lot of policies to protect the FX reserves, our foreign exchange reserves. And what that has meant is that today you can access certain things, some tomorrow you can't. Even though we're a major exporter of oil, we're actually quite an import-dependent country. I mean, to just to give you a sense, over the last year or so, total imports for Nigeria is in the range of about $30 billion. So when you don't have access to foreign exchange for importation, it's a challenge. The micro um, and the SME businesses that I mentioned earlier, a lot of them deal in trading. So they import items largely from China and other parts of Asia and sell. And obviously because, I mentioned, as I said earlier, power has been a challenge. It has been easier and sometimes even cheaper 
to import and sell. But now with the challenge of getting access to foreign exchange, people are having to look to alternate sources and trying to find out other ways of, of doing business. And because the policies haven't been consistent, it's been a challenge for particularly for small businesses in trying to survive. I'm going to jump to the next slide now, which is talking about information. Another challenge that, um, that businesses face is basically access to information. So if someone comes into Nigeria now and decides, I want to run a business doing X, Y, Z, how do I get information on what it is I need to have? What sort of documentation do I need to have? What are the startup capital that do I need to have? What, you know, what is the lay of the land? As it is right now, there isn't any one single place where you can go to get information. So you're picking information from different sources. And more often than not, people find that they need to be on ground uh, to do any type of business in Nigeria. So you can't sit down and just send an email and you know get all the data you want. More often than not, you need to have someone who is on the ground who understands the environment and can explain the environment to whoever it is that's coming in. So that often acts as a barrier to entry, particularly for people, for investments coming in from out of the country. So Accessing information has been, a, has been a challenge, both locally and internationally. And then um, jumping to the next slide, another challenge I would say has been in the area of accessing capital. Now, in addition to being an import-dependent country, we're also very cash-heavy. We do a lot in cash. Now, over the last uh, three, four years, the central bank has put a lot of emphasis on putting in place what we call the cashless policy. So making sure we are on a lot of the banking population, I'll say the people, the population of the country that's banked is less than the estimates that the central bank run is less than 10%. So which means there's a lot of cash that's flowing outside of the banking system. So how do we encourage people to move into the banking system, make sure they have access to financial solutions, and then also make, that also make sure that you know we can track them and then provide credit solutions and things like that to them. So there are certain things that have been in place, certain policies that have been in place, but in recent times, you know, with the change of government, we have a new president that came in last year. So some things were sort of slowed down uh, when the new president came in and when the new central bank governor came in last year. So again, it goes back to policies and how these policies affect how uh, companies can run on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, whether it's accessing capital, accessing information, and then, and then what it also means that it affects the banking environment because obviously if we can't trace an individual or a company or we don't have sufficient records, it's difficult for us to provide any reasonable type of financing. So what you see is that people go to um, other finance, well, personal financing, I would say, money lending type type agencies to to get the income, to get the financing and the capital that they require for their businesses. So just to summarize, like I said, I understand this is just was just meant to be a short um, a short presentation. But to summarize, my view is this: I'm on the conclusion slide now. My view is this: that even though there are challenges, in my view, every challenge in the economy also presents an opportunity. Okay, the challenges that we've seen in um, transportation and energy, for instance, now has led to a lot of public and private partnerships because the government has realized that they can't go it alone. They need to partner with uh, private individuals, private entities, local and international, to make things happen. So we have some companies that are partnering with different state governments in transportation, particularly in the area of rail, putting in the railways or reviving the railways, I should say. We're also seeing that um, when it comes to areas such as access to, to capital, so even though there's a challenge in terms of getting the unbanked, what we've seen is that there's been a surge, particularly in the last five years, of micro-lending structures and institutions. So there are smaller cooperatives coming up, micro-lending structures coming up. So they don't necessarily need to be giving out large values in terms of the loans that are going out. So it's smaller amounts, more community-based lending, but they do what they need to do so, to, so the average mom and pop shop can, can survive. What is also meant is that we have institutions such as um, um, agencies such as the Central Bank, Nigerian, Nigerian Interbank Settlement System, which is basically the settlement system that operates across all the financial institutions in the country, have put in initiatives, things like bank verification number, things to make it easier to link people to their accounts, and therefore it's easier to understand someone's track record. So even though we don't have a credit rating agency here, well, 
not a fully functioning credit bureau, what tends to happen is that someone only gets to the credit bureau if they have defaulted on a loan. But there's no way to track that person's financial records, that financial history to see if they're good for a mortgage, if they're good for debit or credit cards beyond what it is that the person operates with their own bank. So we're seeing a number of initiatives coming up because we have realized that these are things we need to put in place because of the population that we have and the type of um, industries that we have, which are largely retail. It's important for us to put these things in place so that you know the economy can actually grow and can thrive. Now, also, I mentioned earlier that we're having challenges in terms of the policies, in terms of oil prices, because our major product for, of export is, is uh, obviously crude oil. But what that has led to over the last uh, 18 months, I would say, is that a lot of companies are now looking to import substitution because it's been difficult to access foreign exchange. It's been difficult to predict you know, the access to foreign exchange. So companies are now looking to local supplies, local suppliers, which has created a new market, really, a new market for local suppliers to step up their production value, step up their production, and provide these things to agencies and multinationals. I probably would not have spoken to them in times past, but now they have to because that's just, you know, they just need to do that to survive because foreign exchange isn't available the way it used to be. So, I mean, in conclusion, what I would say is that doing business in Nigeria, yes, it can be challenging, um, particularly if one is, shall I say, fairly removed from the environment. It's a unique environment. It doesn't necessarily follow um, standard regulations and standard practices, but it's a unique environment, but there's a lot of opportunity in this nation. The fact that we have a hundred, over 170 million people alone means it's one of the largest markets in Africa, and so we can't be ignored. And it's also an opportunity for anyone who, who decides to, to just capture even just 1% or 10% of the market, if you have a clear marketing strategy, if you have a clear way of making sure you can source your products and your staffing locally, then a lot of companies, we have seen companies, particularly in the e-commerce space, the Congas and Juniors, which are basically trying, I would say, the equivalent of the Amazons, okay? So they are our own Amazon and Co. And they are, they came in just a couple of years ago and they are literally, you know, minting money on a daily basis. So there is a lot of opportunity. There's a lot of opportunity in the country and the challenges that we have being an emerging nation also presents opportunities because the fact that things are not happening is an opportunity for someone to make it happen, working either with the government or going it alone um, as a private enterprise. So I'm happy to take any questions now, if there are any. So the question is that you refer to uh, people who do, who do not use banks that are not in, yeah. that are. How is the government trying to encourage people to use the institutionalized banking and financial oh, services? Okay. One of the things, one of the things the central bank has put in place is what they call the multi-tiered KYC. Know your customer. We found that you know the, the average unbanked person. It's either self-employed, unemployed, or just, you know, it's, it's, um, it's not working in, in a standard environment. So the, the central bank has introduced a tiered level of KYC. And for those that are un unbanked, the basic KYC that's required is basically a phone number. As I mentioned earlier, over 80 million Nigerians have access to mobile phones. So pretty much everyone has a mobile phone, right? So you're watching is your mobile phone number and your passport photograph. So we just need to have a way of identifying who you are and the phone number that you use. Because at the point in time when you're getting your mobile phone, you'd have given the telecoms company some more details. So we'll be writing on that. Now, what that means is that the person that has that basic level of KYC can only do transactions of, I think, the equivalent of about $100. And then, but really at that level, that is what is expected. They'll be doing on a monthly basis. Now, if the person is going to do more transactions, then more information is going to be required. You know, so it's basically the, the level of the KYC gets stepping up until based on the level of transactions and transaction values that the customer does. So that's on the CBN side. In terms of actually bringing people in into the financial industry or financial sector. One of the things that government is also doing is providing some level of, shall I say, support in terms of funding um, grants for community-based transactions, community-based uh, development 
development programs. And so it, what it means is that some funds has to get into the hands of what is a local government area. Someone needs to implement that. And it has been enforced that things are done within the community. So because it's being done with a particular community funds need to, be, need to be made made available and it's been stipulated that those funds will not be made, made available in terms of physical cash so to enforce that the person or the community that wants to get involved in that program has to register with a bank and get their banking details on so they try to tie in community development with financial literacy i don't know if that answers your question okay thank you uh, rolino uh, there are no more questions and i understand it's late in Lagos. Yep. We, on behalf of all the audience here, we thank you for participating with and being part of our, our activity tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our second speaker tonight is uh, based here in Ottawa. He's a trade commissioner with uh, the Department of Global Affairs Canada, which was formerly known as the Department of Foreign Affairs and International Trade and Development. Uh, his name is Marc-André Savage. Um, he has a Bachelor of Commerce from the Université de Québec en Outaouais. He's also a certified management accountant and has been a trade commissioner for the last five, five years or so, six years? About seven years. Seven years. And he was formerly a trade commissioner for Kazakhstan. And he is now currently the trade commissioner for Central Africa and Nigeria. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Makanya Savage. As David said, basically, I'm a trade commissioner working for Global Affairs Canada. Uh, it's my 11 years in the federal service. And today, my goal would be to explain more in details what means the uh, trade commissioner services. First, I would like, however, to thank David as well as the Carleton University for organizing such a great initiative. Thank you. Um, before I start explaining what this uh, Trade Commissioner Service is, I would like first to just show you a bit of facts about Nigeria. As the previous per, uh, speaker already mentioned, uh, the first thing that you notice is the high population. You're talking about uh, almost, uh, well, more than 170 million people. And then what's also noticeable is by 2050, they're actually planning that the population will be possibly the third in the world. It will outpass US. So it will probably be India, then China, and then possibly Nigeria. So from a trade perspective, this is a huge amount of potential consumers and cannot be basically ignored. Uh, the GDP is growing fast, good rate. As David already mentioned, it will be one of the next 11 economy. If you take the G7 and the BRIC countries that are currently leading the growth, in the future, it will be the next 11 that will do this because they will be developing at a higher rate, they will consume more, and so will the economy. And the other thing that's noticeable is one of the languages speaking in Nigeria is English, which is quite useful for trade. Okay. Uh, the next thing I would like to mention is basically the trade relationship that we currently have with Nigeria. In 2015, according to Statistic Canada, we had basically a, a two-way trade of $1.5 billion, which again is, is growing. Now, what I came mostly to discuss today is to explain to you what the Trade Commissioner Service is. Uh, first, it was created in 1894, which means we existed for 121 years now. Our first officer was posted in 1895 to Australia. The other thing that's really important to mention is that it's a service that's free of charge, which means that all Canadian companies can use our services without any cost. Our main goal is basically to boost exports of Canadian companies because in Canada it is proven that one out of every five jobs is related to exports, which means that if we boost exports, we'll create more wealth for Canada, more jobs here. The four main services that we offer to companies, uh, the first one is preparation for international markets. What this means is we have a network of regional offices in Canada. Their main goal is to meet with small and medium-sized companies. Go see them, look at their products, see if there's potential for them to export. Ask them directly, have you thought about exporting these great products? Because I believe there's a market for you somewhere. That's the first step. After that, um, we also work with them to get them ready if they're not ready to actually export. From abroad, we have 174 offices across the planet. 
and their job is to do the next step. If a company is interested, let's say, to do business in Nigeria, what we would do? Well, they could contact directly, basically, our trade offices there and ask them, basically, about market potential, which means that trade commissioners over there would sit down with them and look at their product and explore with them what's the potential of the market for this specific product in that country and also give them advices of how to do business in, let's say, Nigeria. This is really useful information for businesses, especially when they're not aware of the market or if in some scenario, if they don't speak the local language. Uh, the third, basically, uh, service that we offer is qualified contacts. Let's say I have a business and I'm looking in Nigeria for a credible lawyer, accountant. I want to have basically a local partner that might be uh, do business with me or basically supply my products in the country. So what these people can do is they go see the three commissioners and they will give them a list of, let's say, three or four companies with good reputation that can help them out. So that's one thing we do. We basically try to find solutions for them because small and medium-sized companies, often the owner is also the one promoting the product. So if that person is doing a lot of effort traveling, we want to minimize the amount of time he does to maximize the result. And that's how we contribute. And the last and not the least main service that we offer is problem solving. This means a company basically runs in problems. It might be their products are stuck at the, uh, the customs and their perishable goods. So then they need help fast, someone that can help them clear and solve the problem but it can be basically anything. So our trade commissioners would look at the problem and try to find solutions for them, and that's our job. And then there's other services as well that we also offer the Canadian companies. One of them is we're gonna basically go meet local companies and try to find opportunities for Canadian companies. Again, the goal is to boost the Canadian exports. So we're gonna see local purchases and ask them, do you need anything, any equipment, or something like that? And then we're also gonna promote at the same time Canadian capabilities, which means that we have all these presentation of what Canada can produce. And we're gonna to try to find a match between what they need and what Canada can actually provide. Uh, other things that we do, we promote Canada in general as an investment destination. In some market, they have a lot of money. So why not promote them investing in Canadian companies or in mines or something like that? We also promote education in Canada. It's a big industry for uh, the economy. Uh, then we also organize delegation to visit trade shows, both in, let's say, Nigeria and in Canada. So our trade commissioners, if they have enough interest for Canadian companies, they will organize a delegation around a trade show that takes place in Nigeria to try to match them with local businesses to, again, make them have more contracts. Or the other side, they will convince companies and government official purchasers to come to Canada and then visit a trade show and at the same time meet the Canadian companies. And least, not, uh, not the least, we work closely with Export Development Canada. They can basically provide financing for anybody who wants to purchase Canadian products or services. And this is a great edge, because in some countries, the borrowing rate at the bank can be 20, 30%. So if EDC, because they make other studies of the risk, can provide financing for, let's say, 10%, it's a great deal for the purchaser. And they might be able to purchase the Canadian good because of this deal. Uh, the last thing I want to mention is for every dollar that the Canadian government spent in the Trade Commissioner Service, historically, there's 23 to 27 dollars that get reinjected in the Canadian economy, creating jobs and wealth. And, and that's why, regardless of which government is in power, we're always basically a, a focus of the Minister of Trade. Uh, afterwards, I would like to just basically, if you're interested to do business in Nigeria, we also have a local presence. Uh, we have four trade commissioner locally placed. There's one that is in the capital, Abuja, and there's three in basically the business center, which is Lagos. Lagos by itself is the fifth economy of sub-Saharan Africa. 
and uh, the Canadian companies are actually growing their presence since the last four years. So the, they're making good business there. Uh, however, everything is not pink. Uh, there are several problems that Canadian companies are facing in Nigeria. One of them is the high inflation, uh, the lack of qualified technical workers for when you want to go in new industries. Uh, there's the administrative barriers. Uh, we haven't ratified the FIPA yet, which is an investment uh, agreement that would protect Canadian investment in Nigeria. Uh, there's also the major en energy deficit. It's actually uh, interesting. Slovakia, which has 3% of the population of Nigeria, produce more electricity. And this is obviously a problem that a lot of Canadian companies are facing because there's a lack of energy. And the last one is obtaining foreign exchange, uh, which the previous speaker already mentioned, and also Dr. Olayele will mention later. Uh, the last thing as well is infrastructure. They need roads, they need train rails, they need new house, they need basically a waste management strategy. They need airport and airlines to support this huge population. However, you can always do the glass half full, half empty. There's a lots of problems that Kenyan companies are facing, but most of the problem, basically, they represent opportunities. Their agriculture needs upgrading. Uh, they need possibly higher equipment. Canada produced this. Education, voc vocational education, Canada could help to basically train the labor. Infrastructure, they need basically engineer firms and so on. So it really depends your perspective. Like it's always a higher risk, but there's also higher return. And we often talk to companies, um, and whenever we ask them, where do you make your best return on investment? And surprisingly, a lot of these companies say it's Africa because there's a higher risk, but they make so much more money at the end. And I like to do basically a, a hockey analogy that a good company and a good hockey player goes where the puck is. However, a great hockey player or a great company anticipate where the puck or the market will be. And it, from our point of view, they'll be ready and they'll mark so much better. And f there's no doubt in our mind that Nigeria will be where the puck or the market will be in the future. And if you're ahead of all the competition there, you will eventually uh, make great profit. Last but very important, uh, this is the website of the Trade Commissioner Service. So if you or a company that you know basically wants to do business and is a Canadian company, we offer free service for everything I mentioned. And you can easily find on this website basically the contact information of all the officers, both in the regional office in Canada, but also in our offices across the planet. So it's a quite useful tool. In a, I encourage you to uh, share it around with everybody you know. Again, we've been there around for 120 years and we will likely be there if you decide one day to make a business. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mark Andre. We have our, as our next speaker, a representative of a Canadian manufacturer who exports and has a successful experience and story to, to, to share with us. And uh, representing them, t the firm Incas tonight, is retired Major General David Fraser, who joins us from Toronto, who's here with us. And uh, Major uh, General Fraser has an, he's with, formerly with uh, National Defense, where he was, um, he commanded our Canadian and international soldiers in Afghanistan, Bosnia, C Cyprus. And he has extensive staff and planning skills with the Canadian Forces, United States, NATO, and other government departments. And uh, he has a, a degree in psychology, political science. He's a master's degree in defense management and policy, as well as numerous accreditations from the Ivy Business School and the Canadian Forces College and the National Defense University. So it's my pleasure to uh, have David Fraser join us and, and tell us about Thank His company's much. experience is over in Nigeria as a Canadian exporter. Okay. Thank you very much for having me here tonight. Um, it is a, indeed a pleasure to be with you. And now we're going to go from about 40,000 feet, we're going to go up to about three feet. Okay, because I'm actually uh, running a company and a group of company that actually is doing business in uh, Nigeria. 
Now, this is daunting because I actually graduated from this college or this university a very long time ago. My son graduated from this uh, university, and if that wasn't daunting enough, because I know this building in many different shapes and forms, um, my professor is here from my master's program, and she's sitting right there, and she knows more about me than I want any of you to know, okay? So uh, this is actually great to be with you here tonight. Um, I'm going to show you two videos. The first video is just to give you an overview of what Incas Manufacturing is. We've been around since 1993. We're a group of companies. We're a privately owned, family-run business. It started off with cash and transit. We're now uh, building armored vehicles. I've got a bunch of books over there for you to pick up if you want. We do a whole bunch of other things, including IT, uh, environmental remediation, and the theme of what you're going to see is security. Security of the person, security of your information, security of the environment. So that's, we're a great Canadian company that is global. So that's the first thing, and I'll let the video do the talking. And the second one is, um, and I'll, I'll do a bit of an introduction in between, is actually from our chairman of Incas Trans in Lagos, uh, Nigeria, Bill, uh, who will be giving you a talk that was uh, recorded two days ago for you, uh, talking about the Incas story in Nigeria, and I'll hold off uh, there uh, to do that introduction. But first, let me just give you a little bit of a teaser about what we are. At its 20-year anniversary celebration, Incas held a ribbon-cutting ceremony marking the grand opening of its new facility in Toronto. Industry leaders, government officials, representatives from Ontario financial institutions and municipalities joined Incas to commemorate the event. The newly built facility integrates a state-of-the-art office space for over 200 employees, a manufacturing plant, and the first and only armored vehicle showroom in Canada, all under one roof. Guests had a chance to participate in a tour of the production facility to see firsthand the level and quality of production it takes to become a globally recognized armored vehicle manufacturer. From special purpose vehicles and luxury armored limousines to bulletproof SUVs and discrete sedans, Incas designs and produces its entire vehicle line in-house. Incas is a world-renowned corporation that operates in many sectors. Armored vehicle and safe manufacturing, security and merchant services, and metal fabrication all fall under the Incas umbrella. Passionate in the pursuit of excellence, each company produces industry-leading products that are deployed around the globe. With the ongoing advancement of global security remaining its primary objective, Incas happily celebrates two decades of excellence while opening the doors to a safer future for all of us. We're 20 years old, and in fact, uh, so what we've done, uh, cash and transit. In, uh, we're the third largest cash and transit in Canada behind Brinks and Garda. Uh, we did that in 93 and 96. We started building vehicles, and, and I'll let the vehicles... Uh, uh, we build up-armored sedans, SUVs, and uh, special purpose vehicles for uh, parts of the region of the world where, there, in fact, you need armored vehicles. 93% of our vehicles go overseas. Main markets are South America, Africa, Eastern Europe, Southwest Asia, and the Middle East. For the next 10 years, the biggest markets are going to be, in fact, are going to be in uh, South America, Eastern Europe, Africa. Uh, Nigeria has been a de conscious decision of us to go and, and uh, address the security issues in Africa. What we have done there is we've been there for eight years now. We picked Nigeria because of its size, its location, its economy, and it is also the biggest economy down there. It's also our regional hub. 
The one thing about Incas I want to emphasize here is we just don't sell you a product. We sell you a system of systems, and we also are all about capacity building. So instead of just building a car, what we do is we start off with a sales rep that goes to a country and sells you a car, and then we open up a sales office. Then we open up a showroom. Then we open up a, a maintenance facility. And in later on this year, we'll actually be opening up an assembly plant in Nigeria to service the region uh, that uh, needs our products. And again, they're defensive in nature. Uh, nothing that we do is offensive. Everything that we do is designed to protect people and protect the environment. So the one other thing that's kind of an anomaly, and Bill will talk about it, we have an environmental remediation company, and that's called Incas Environmental, Inca Strand, and we work with companies like Shell, where we have a big project right now in Nigeria, and that project is to remediate all the efforts that have happened from oil uh, processing. We're actually cleaning up that oil and actually putting the environment back to the way it was. And so again, that's creating jobs, that's creating IP. It's a, it's a Canadian uh, uh, patented product, but we are exporting all that into Nigeria and we're working with other uh, country, companies to actually develop that. So that's what we're doing. And we also, in addition to doing armored vehicles, uh, one thing you have to learn in your, in your business world is diversification. It's a good news, bad news story. Good news is we're doing really well in Nigeria. The bad news is the bank says you're doing too well in Nigeria. What are you going to do? So we've diversified into the regions. We've diversified now that we're starting to produce limousines, soft skin limousines, the ones that you will do, use when you graduate, and so you're not drinking and driving. And we also do things like uh, hearses and whatnot for the Canadian and uh, North American market. So again, that's a diversification based on our experience uh, from armored vehicle manufacturing. Medium-sized enterprise of about 270 Canadians. And I will say the other thing that, about our company, which is really unique, is for the most part, the working language on the shop floor is not English. We are first-generation Canadians that come from all around the world. A lot of the armored vehicles are built by people who come from Eastern Europe. A lot of the limousines and the, and the hearses that we build are actually built from people from the Caribbean. So we actually have imported uh, people from around the world. We had an, uh, a manufacturing facility in Dubai, but we reshored it back here into Canada because of one thing, you, people. We did it because the best people are here in this country, the supply uh, system is here in this country, and we're now exporting all of that to Nigeria, that idea, so we can do the same thing in uh, Africa on a regional basis. So let me just go and introduce to you Bill. Yeah, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Bill Ukemdere. I am the African partner for Incas Canada and I also sit on the board of Incas Canada. I want to take this opportunity to give you the experience of Incas Canada in the past eight years. I came into Canada in the year 2000 and in the year 2008 I met my friend Mr. David Kazanski, and I presented to him the opportunities Nigeria has. Like every other Canadian and business, he was not excited and it was not something he would really want to touch. But eventually, we started trading. I started buying a few luxury armored vehicles. Actually, I started with the cash and transit vehicles into Nigeria. Then he saw the need after pressurizing him to come with me to Nigeria. And I want to say Nigeria is in West Africa. And it has a population of about 180 million people in a land area of about 900,000 
square kilometers. The land is highly fertile for agriculture, and all over Nigeria are various solid minerals, and Nigeria is rich in oil and gas. We have a working population between the ages of 25 and 60 of over 60 million people, and they are highly trained. But the issue is Nigeria has been badly reported in the Western media. And these negative reports, what I would choose to call propaganda, but not that we don't have problems, that has scared Canada totally away. Nigeria, like every other nation, particularly developing nations, had their first share of challenges. Nigeria has a huge infrastructure deficit. We don't have electricity, power is short. We have a lot of, uh, we don't have good access routes. We have challenges in education, we have challenges in healthcare. We have all these challenges. We have our fair share of insecurity in the Niger Delta, in the north, and all over. We do have our fair share of corruption. But these, to me, present a huge opportunity. And that was why in 2008, I told David, let's get into Nigeria because the security challenges are, for us, a huge opportunity in Canada. When we started bringing in the vehicles, shortly, and thanks to ACAS, because ACAS is a company that is highly improving. The research and development in Canada has made ACAS Canada today to be one of the best companies in the world producing premium vehicles, which suits the Nigerian market. And today, ACAS is doing, with our presence in Lagos, Nigeria, we are doing over 400 vehicles in a year. We are selling cars in transit to the financial institutions. We are selling our personnel carriers to the Nigerian security, the police, the military, to the customs. We are selling luxury vehicles to high net worth people and most of the politically exposed people. And today, ACAS is a household name in Nigeria when it comes to premium quality armored vehicles. If we did not take the advantage of the security challenges in Nigeria, ACAS story will be this today. Because in the past eight years, ACAS has grown but I want to say that Nigeria presented a good platform to penetrate Africa. We are selling in Ghana, we are selling in Cote d'Ivoire, we are selling in Angola and virtually everywhere in Africa. But that is not all Nigeria has. Our agriculture produces variety of products that are begging for processing into semi and other finished products. We produce a lot that are not processed, which Canada can do. In the oil and gas, there is a lot of opportunity. And we chose three years back to look at what is happening in oil and gas in Nigeria. There is a lot of environmental challenges. Oil spillage, oil, uh, water body contamination, the soil contamination and all. We chose as anchors Canada to come into the environment business in Nigeria. Today, we are working with Shell and some other IOCs to attempt to clean up the Niger Delta, to engage in oil spillage cleanup and bioremediation. And it is a good story. And Incas is doing well. Today, Incas Canada and I, we are proud to say we are engaging in the mining activities in Nigeria and we have acquired some acreages for mining. These are all opportunities Nigeria presents. But many Canadian businesses have chosen to listen to the 
median in the West. The Americas are still here, the Europeans are still here. The Canadians are not coming in, but they are waiting. The Chinese in the past 10 years are investing over two to three billion dollars in Nigeria. South Koreans are doing the same, Indians are doing the same, so why not Canada? I want to let you know that Nigeria is a politically stable country that practices presidential democracy. We have a bicameral legislation, legislature that uh, has been enacting laws that are favorable to businesses. We have a very independent judicial system. Our judiciary is one of the very best, I can say, in any part of the world today. Our judiciary is a very independent and transparent system. We have laws that protect businesses. The Nigeria Investment Promotion Council has even what they call the OSIC, the one-stop shop that makes registration of businesses easy. Expert report is very easy. This commission has laws that makes investment repatriation, both capital and profits, seamless and easy. We have laws that protect patents and trademarks that reduces the pension for faking and uh, counterfeiting. Nigeria has laws. We have a commission called the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission that is fighting money laundering in business environments. And all these are aimed to make the Nigerian business environment very friendly. And I want to say that Nigeria subscribes to the financial and international reporting standards that our business reports are very transparent. And ACAS has exploited these opportunities and ACAS has very good story to tell. I'm able to say that Africa is the new frontier for Canada and any other developed world. It's the new frontier for the 21st century. And the gateway is Nigeria. Nigeria is the gateway into Africa. So I want to encourage my fellow Canadians to take advantage of what Nigeria presents and step in and see what Canada can do in the area of solid minerals, in the area of oil and gas, security, uh, infrastructure development, there is nothing Canada cannot do within Nigeria. We want to say that the Inca story is a testimony and we would want to encourage other Canadian businesses to step forward and take advantage of what Nigeria presents. It is not just as bad as it's presented. I want to thank you for listening to me and I want to believe that if Canada can think of what next Nigeria is a destination, we are welcome to Nigeria and thanks for listening to me. God bless. I think we should send this now. So let me just finish off by saying why Nigeria? Economy? regional access to other countries, huge uh, uh, producer and exporter of natural resources, which are going to have to be remediated on the aftermath of what economy, and that's what we do for media, uh, environmental remediation. And for security, when you look at the Ministry of the Interior and what Nigeria is having to fight in the Northeast, Incas has products to actually do that. So we provide a system of systems for the country to provide security, not only for its people, but also for its environment and for the regions around it. And I'll be answer, happy to answer any of the questions you have after that. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, David. Our next speaker comes to us uh, from Regina, Saskatchewan, where he's a professor at the University of Saskatchewan. His name is uh, Dr. Fred Olalebe. And Fred is... Um, uh, he's an economist by profession, and he's a senior policy expert and an infrastructure uh, specialist. 
He has worked for the government of British Columbia on the, the Department of Energy Mines and Petroleum Resources, where he managed a complex portfolio of institutional projects. Prior to that, he was a professional banker with the Global Trade Division of City Group in Lagos, Nigeria. He holds a PhD in economics from the University of Lancaster in the UK and a master's degree in economics from the University of Victoria. And he's also a certified project management professional. And I must also say that uh, if it were not for uh, Fred's uh, assistance, we wouldn't be having this uh, event tonight. He was instrumental in uh, securing the participation of the people that you've uh, seen uh, from Lagos. And uh, so uh, as the president and CEO of a, a global economic institute for Africa, which is an NGO, uh, it is a form of, of think tank. And tonight, uh, he, Fred is going to be presenting a talk on the uh, currency foreign exchange concerns facing uh, Canadian companies operating in Nigeria. Okay, so good uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thanks for uh, the opportunity here. Uh, like the, the cover slide says, I'm going to be talking about the current uh, currency crisis in Nigeria uh, and implications for, for foreign investment. Yeah, so pretty much about uh, four major issues, you know, will be analyze here in detail. I will look at uh, currency crisis, you know, within the context of uh, what is happening in Nigeria. We'll look at some of the economic and, and political issues, you know, that surround the current uh, environment in Nigeria. I'll look at uh, a popular model in economics, you know, which helps to analyze some of the issues. And like you are aware, the the managing director of the International Monetary Fund recently visited Nigeria, you know, will quickly look at uh, her stance. Uh, the implications for, for foreign investment will be analyzed, as well as the way forward. Next. Uh, so to begin with, uh, a very good question to actually ask is uh, if Nigeria is in reality, you know, facing a currency crisis. It's, uh, it's very hard, really, to, to define a currency crisis. Economists generally agree that uh, it is part of a financial crisis, you know, which is uh, often precipitated by the complex interplays between uh, the macroeconomy, investor expectations, government politics, and to a large extent, uh, politics. So for countries uh, under a fixed exchange regime, it becomes even more frightening when you, when you consider that the central bank doesn't have uh, FX, you know, foreign exchange, to maintain the country's uh, fixed exchange re regime. So that often results in speculative attacks on, on the uh, foreign exchange market. So Nigeria really is facing a major a currency crisis, which is caused by the drop in oil prices. Like we all know, Nigeria is a monocultural economy, uh, and its inability to diversify uh, the revenue base of the economy presents a major uh, challenge. Again, back to back to economics. Really, you know, uh, one of the major issues that we are talking about here is, is about uh, trading balances, uh, specifically balance of payment uh, deficit which is caused by the heavy reliance on imports. For, for so many years, you know, the country has relied on petrodollars. That is foreign exchange from uh, the sale of oil. So Nigeria has relied on petrodollars to, to fund its uh, import cravings. And the uncertainties in trade and exchange rate policies continue to exert pressures, you know, on the macro economies and household incomes suffer uh, substantially. Next. So, uh, current realities. I, I think at this point, we should really uh, face it. Nigeria is the biggest country. It's the largest economy in Africa. 
and the most populous nation. But in the realm of economics, it's a small open economy, you know. It can, Nigeria can hardly influence uh, the direction of uh, our economic uh, our realities in the world. It's a price taker, you know. You produce uh, natural resources and primary commodities. So to a large extent, it's going to have to come to terms with that reality that is a price taker. Again, the uh, sharp drops in uh, global prices, you know, continue to uh, decimate uh, government revenues from what it was about two years ago, you know, to less than $40. This is even uh, aggravated by other external shocks, you know. Look at other commodities like gold, like um, uh, diamond or what have you. The prices are going down and so it's a precarious um, uh, situation, if you will. Uh, and in terms of uh, the economic policy uh, direction for the Nigerian government, it's recently you know, announced uh, a ban on unnecessary consumer items that the government feels is not necessary. Added to that is trying to promote local manufacturing. And it's a medium to longer term economic policy agenda is to really diversify the economy away from oil and to look at um, agriculture and, and solid minerals. So that's big on uh, the economic policy agenda. But how much time they have to implement that and to see results, uh, that remains to be seen. And then let me quickly talk about uh, politics. You really cannot, uh, you cannot uh, underestimate the influence of politics in all of this. The government is elected for a four-year term. Uh, it's, it's spent one year already. So they are really under, uh, they are under pressure, if you like to perform in the next one year. By the time it's midterm, then the electorates, the people are gonna be asking questions. And that to a large extent, you know, further uh, complicates the issues because it's it's unlikely that they're gonna to wanna to take some risks that may not produce a, a quick result. So tough choices ahead. In terms of the issues, the, the central bank, like uh, you all know, devalued the Naira by about 8% in, in 2014 November and fixed the official exchange rate at $198 to a Naira to the dollar. This has created a huge gap, you know, between the official and uh, uh, parallel uh, exchange rates. Uh, and again, it's also restricted af access to foreign exchange. And over 40 our consumer items now are, are being banned, you know, in order to uh, 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 maintain its uh, foreign reserves and what have you. So in the local economy, a lot of a lot of uh, adverse effects, you know, are the results of all of this. You see red seeking behavior on the rise now. A lot of people now don't even believe in manufacturing again. If you allocated for foreign exchange. Then if you are able to maybe just sell that off or do some round tripping and get 30% in, in profit, why bother then to even go through the, the stress of uh, going through the cycle, which can even actually yield maybe 10%. And for, for local manufacturers, the uncertainties continue to let them lay off and do a whole lot of stuff, you know, to improve their bottom line. So uh, a, 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 a current theme in Nigeria now is the whole idea of people trying to persuade uh, Nigerian citizens and even other stakeholders to buy local goods and what have you, you know, like a moral assuasion kind of thing, you know. But to what extent that works, you know, again remains to be seen. Uh, well, I'm going to be very brief. Eh? I know I don't have a lot of time. So this framework, uh, the impossible trinity, is a foremost uh, model in international uh, economics, you know, which of course explains why policymakers' hands are often tied up. You don't have a lot of choices, especially if uh, a fixed exchange rate regime is on the table. So, but the one thing that I would really like to add here is that from January 2014 till date, the Central Bank of Nigeria had its foreign exchange reserves, you know, drop from what it was to about 28 billion. It has fallen by over 33%. 
that's 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 profound and when you even look at the monthly bill of the central bank for its import bills uh, and you look at the mega inflows you know in the face of current economic realities then there's the risk that its foreign exchange reserves may be depleted within the next six months uh so let's let's talk about uh, the president you know like I said recently, the, the managing director of the IMF visited Nigeria, and uh, one of the uh, pieces of economic policy advice given was for government to consider the value in the Naira, that's the local uh, currency. But the president I know is a student of history. In, in the 1980s, you know, the structural adjustment program decimated Nigeria. It produced hardship of unprecedented proportions, led to swollen external debt, huge fiscal gap, you know. The middle class was literally decimated, decimated. University professors could not pay their bills. Hardworking middle class families could not put food on the table as a result of a uh, high exchange rate, interest rates, and other, you know, macroeconomic uh, shocks that really wiped out the, the, the middle class. Everybody was scampering, you know, to cope. A lot of families had to take three, four jobs just to pay the bills. And that was even uh, the genesis of the brain drain syndrome in Nigeria. Before that whole episode of SAP, Nigerians who went overseas to go to school would always, 90% of the time, they would go back to Nigeria to help the system. But after that of SAP, Nigerians who went overseas to study, you know, a lot of them stayed back. And even those who had studied abroad and went back home started to flee. So my question here then is, do you blame the president for not devaluing the Naira? I don't blame him, you know, for one simple reason. Every politician, you know, will be very careful to learn from history and to not filter away uh, the goodwill that they enjoy from, from the people. You may call that politics, yes, but I also call it common sense, you know. Uh, and and, and to, to add one more piece to that, it was about the same era, you know, when the president was in his youthful days. He was a military uh, president then. So I'm sure he, he vividly remembers that episode. Uh, let's move on to, to the next uh, slide. So implications for, for foreign investment, really. So let's, let's look at the implications for foreign investment here. Before uh, March 2015, when we had the last elections, you know, Nigeria was a prime destination for foreign investors in the whole world. I mean, it was a very hot market. Everybody wanted Nigeria. But with uh, the current realities and the currency crisis, investor appetite, of course, remains uh, weak. A lot of foreign investors are cautious, you know, they are watching the trend. And for even some of them who have uh, uh, assets that are denominated in Naira, they've chosen to, you know, take some of their capital away. Uh, but the good news is some still sit on the fence. They are watching. They are analyzing the trends, looking at the news and uh, just looking to see some uh, stability in economic policy. Perhaps that can be enough to you know convince them to to invest and, and and do other things and i should quickly mention fipa here fipa the foreign investment protection agreement which nigeria with the nigerian government executed with the government of uh, canada uh, about two years ago that agreement is executed already only for uh, a few items you know to be to be finalized had had vipa been finally executed you know I'm sure a lot of uh, the Canadian investors who are in Nigeria would know that there's nothing that can, you know, affect them from repatriating their profits and what have you. So this whole episode again emphasizes the need to clean up the table and finalize everything that has to do with FIPA. That is a one, that, that is a, a, a tool that can really uh, give them the comfort level that, that, that they do, you know, uh, deserve. And the devaluation of the Naira may also grossly affect the economic size of Nigeria. Like you know, two years ago, the economy was rebased, and Nigeria overnight became the largest economy in Africa. 
So if government would bow to pressure and devalue the Naira, that means an economy that is presently over $500 billion could overnight shrink to $300 billion, you know. No, 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 no politician or leader, what is all, would want to see that happen. And finally, under this slide, uh, you talk about foreign portfolio investment. Uh, the, the, the market capitalization for, for the stock market in Nigeria continues to go down, you know. A lot of people who have stocks and other securities, you know, are, are not so um, are comfortable with what is happening, and that has affected that. Uh, the current scenario may also delay re-entry. Yeah. They are watching to see what, what's going to happen. Uh, it is hoped that if there is a likely rebound in oil prices, that may again help to um, address the situations. And also for Nigerians who are in diaspora and other foreign investors who may be interested in, in, in investing, you know, in real estate and other durable assets, they are really having a good time now. I know of a lot of Canadian investors and Nigerians who are overseas. This is the time that everybody is really trying to acquire one uh, parcel of land or the other because you get your hard currencies, send that to Nigeria, you know, it, it can do a whole lot of stuff for you. Yeah, so my last slide here is really to, 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 to allude to the Nigerian spirit. You know, Nigeria is known for something in the world. I don't know to what extent you have followed this country called Nigeria. At that point when you think everything is over, that is when Nigeria rises to the occasion. I can give you many instances, time will not permit, but I'll just give you two. 1996 Olympic soccer, when the whole world thought we were done, Nigeria beat uh, uh, Brazil to, to win the gold. Ebola crisis, two years ago, that was a big scary thing. Everybody thought with Nigeria down to Ebola, it would be the end of uh, the Western Africa subregion, but it never happened. Nigeria stood to the occasion. So what am I saying here? Uh, things are not as uh, gloomy and as bad as uh, uh, analysts and other pundits are saying. Government is working hard to uh, use monetary policies, you know, to create short-term uh, solutions interest rates and, and all that is have been, you know, uh, used as you speak to 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 to, to remedy the, the whole situation. You also do know about uh, the Treasury single account. This government has fought, you know, uh, incessantly, has fought corruption and in the process, uh, over two trillion Naira, you know, was recently realized from the Treasury single account by plugging leakages and other uh, unnecessary um, expenditures. The, two t the 2016 budget passed by the government of Nigeria is the biggest ever. And a lot of economists, financial analysts, and other stakeholders believe that the expansion in nature of this budget will, of course, uh, address some of the gaps and shocks that we are seeing. It will stimulate the economy, create jobs, and provide, again, support and palliative measures to some of the actors. And even when you now think about coordinating monetary with fiscal policies, then uh, it remains to be seen. One last uh, policy tool that I also think is giving foreign investors a lot of confidence is this whole idea of creating a two-tier foreign exchange market. So what that means is that uh, the monetary authorities are trying to allocate foreign exchange in the first market at the official rate. By so doing, uh, priority areas like fuel imports and local manufacturers can have access to foreign exchange at the official rate. And then there's a second market, which is uh, a flexible and perhaps a more a market determined uh, exchange rate that thrives in the second market. And so other players, like foreign investors, institutional players, uh, and students in foreign universities and institutions can buy and sell foreign exchange, you know, more easily. Uh, in due course, this result will try to, 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 to trickle in, and we will see it. But I will end my analysis by saying that Nigeria never gives up. 
When you expect the worst, that is when Nigeria rises to the occasion. Uh, thank you very much. And that's our last guest speaker, and I'm going to call uh, the Associate Dean, uh, Lorraine Dyke, up to uh, the mic to uh, conclude the evening. Great, thank you. I'd like to thank uh, our speakers tonight, both the ones who were here uh, with us in Ottawa and the ones who were available online, and we'll be reaching out to them to share our thanks with them uh, going forward, and also uh, our thanks to David. I think po most of you in the room know that international business is really uh, part of the DNA of Sprott School of Business. We offer m many different levels of programming and many different ways in which we're involved in international business. At the undergraduate level, we have a Bachelor of International Business, which is, you know, just celebrated its 20th anniversary. Uh, it was one of the first in Canada. We have also international business as an option within our Bachelor of Commerce. At the graduate level, in our MBA, we have five concentrations. Two of them have a focus on international uh, affairs and, and business. One is international business. The other is international development management, which is unique uh, in the world, we believe. Uh, and really very innovative. And uh, we also offer our MBA in international locations. So we are ourselves engaged in international business through our programs in Shanghai, China, and also in Bogota, Colombia. And as you see looking around the room, we have a very international student body, a very international um, faculty. And on top of the work that we do directly in the school, we have exchange agreements with uh, 100, about 130 exchange agreements in over 30 countries. So international business is really fundamental to what we do here in Sprott School of Business, and so we're so appreciative of David for organizing tonight's event and our speakers uh, for joining us and sharing with us their experiences and their ideas about how we can do better international business and do business specifically uh, with Nigeria. So I have a little token of our appreciation for our speakers. And also for David, for all of his work. Thank you. So I assume now you're going to let the students take a short break before resuming class and trying to make sense of all of the interesting things that you have learned tonight. I know I've learned a lot. I'm sure you have as well. So thank you.